So, folks, I want to uh, just go over this one change to the exam that I made. Uh, if you're coming in now, make sure that I get your name before you leave. So I think I got everybody up to Cheyenne, but just check with me when you leave. Uh, just catch me after. Um, so is number 17 on the exam? It's not really that important for you to be concerned with right now, but it, it may have, many of you saw an increase of three points on Moodle or three point something points. And so let me just, just describe what happened. So I said that if you, if you run a half mile at a seven minute per mile pace, and then another half mile at a five minute per mile pace, then what is the average, or what's your average velocity or your average pace for that whole time? Well, if you think about this, and I know several of you said this, and I just sort of shrugged it off because I already thought that I knew the answer. But if you run seven minute a mile for a half a mile, then that's going to be 3.5 minutes, right? Because you run seven minute mile, you run half a mile, that's three and a half minutes. Or if you run a five minute mile, that's going to be two and a half minutes. And so the total time then is going to be six minutes. And since you ran, you know, a half mile for each of those, then that's going to be six minutes per one mile. And so the answer was supposed to be equal to six minutes per mile, not greater than or less than. Um, I was thinking of a different problem, and it, it worked out differently because I don't get, when you're talking about the car problem, I posted that on the FAQ. That when you have, say, uh, a 30 mile an hour car and a 50 miles per hour car, if those travel the same distances, then the average of these two, the average velocity for those two, and that's what that slide was that I, that I sent you off, is going to be not 40, but less than 40 miles per hour, or actually, uh, yeah, less than 40 miles per hour. Because you're traveling for a longer time at the slower speed. Okay? Don't sweat this right now. It's not going to be on the quiz or on the exam right now. In fact, that question, you won't ever see it again. I'll just strike it from my bank. Okay? Many of you did see an increase. That is a good point that, you know, if you feel like a problem is, is not right, then please do write me because you're the first ones to see the questions. And sometimes when you get 150 eyes on our 140 or so eyes on a, on a set of questions, sometimes you just see something that I didn't see. So please come to me if you think something's wrong. Please come to me and I'll, I'll fix it. Okay? Good job. I appreciate that. Thank you, Brooks and one other student actually told me about that. Um, let's look at projectile motion. First, I just want to ask, are there any particular questions that you want to work on? Okay, let's just work projectile motion then. Uh, I'm going to bring the lights down just a little bit. Is the TV up back there, Cheyenne? Yeah. Okay, okay let's look at exam one, or excuse me, exam two for fall 19. You don't have this in your book, but it's, it's a good one to look at. And I want to look at number one. I know you don't have... Uh, free response on your test, but this is still a useful question to look at because, you know, you'll see this question, but you'll see it in multiple choice format. You might think that's easier. I don't, I'm not sure that's easier. I think it's easier to do it in free response because then you get, you know, partial credit and you can, I can grade your actual work. So let's work through that problem. From ground level, you kick a ball with a mass of 1.1 kilograms at an angle of 30 degrees in the horizontal with a speed of 18 meters per second. Can y'all see that in the back? Yeah? All right. Uh, first of all, the mass that I give you here is just not relevant. You don't need to know the mass. It never really comes in. Later, when we get into Chapter 4, the mass will be relevant for, for, for particular reasons, but not in this case. Um, this is, as we talked about in this most recent class, is sort of our prototypical projectile motion problem where I have an object that starts at ground level, goes up, and then returns back to ground level. You're absolutely going to have a question like this. You're going to have to work through this question. It's going to be sort of like those questions I gave you before where I want you to just know them whole, and I want you to do them really quickly and everybody get them right because you know you're going to see it on the exam. Um, I can ask you a number of different things. I can ask you what is the maximum y height 
Or I can ask you, what is the maximum X range? I can ask you how long it's been in the air or how long it takes it to get up to the top of the trajectory. And then there are some sort of more nuanced questions, like we looked at um, in the workbook, those quick test questions. There was the one where I just gave you the angle theta and the time in the air and asked for the initial velocity. We worked that in class either today or this past Wednesday. Well, let's look at this. This is sort of typical and something you'll see. The first thing that you want to do, well, the first thing that I always do is to find the x and y components. So I say v naught x and v naught y, and I'm just going to sort of put these off to the side, and that way they're there for reference when I need them. v naught x is going to be 18 times cosine of 30, and v naught y is going to be 18 times sine of 30. I got the 18 from the initial speed. That's the um, initial velocity of the object. This comes out to be 16 meters per second. And then V naught Y is going to be 18 sine of 30. That's going to be 9 meters per second. So those are my initial X and Y velocities. In order to find the maximum height, I need to find the time at this point. And this is where we return back to those problems like we did last time in class or in the last exam where I throw something up and it comes down and I want to find what is the time at the top of the trajectory. Now let's think this through. If I want to know the time at the top of the trajectory, I know something about that position. I know that the velocity at that position in the y direction is zero. The velocity in the x direction is not zero. The velocity in the x direction maintains its initial value. But that doesn't matter here. All I'm concerned about is the y velocity. So I can say that vy at the top is equal to zero. So to find the time, I would say vy equals v naught y plus ayt. That's going to be zero equals nine minus 10 times t. And solving for t, I get t equals 0.9 seconds. So that's the time to get to the top of the trajectory. I often like to put this like T top, just because to help me distinguish it from another time, which we're going to need to find soon. Uh, define the maximum height of the ball. I say Y equals V naught Y T plus one half A Y T squared. And that's going to be nine. I get that from up here times T is 0.9 seconds, that's from right here, minus 5, that's half of A, A is negative 10, half of negative 10 is negative 5, times 0.9 squared. Now let's see, that is, uh, I get 4 for that, 4 meters. Okay? That's my maximum value of the height, the maximum, uh, the maximum height. I also want to know what is the range. That is, I want to know what is the position out here. What is the value for x? Now, I know what the time is out there because I found this time. What is the time at the end of the trajectory? It's not 0.9 seconds. It is, it's 1.8 seconds. All right, so t total. I'll call it, is equal to 1.8 seconds. I just doubled the overall time. That's what we did on exam one. Throw something up, it takes 0.9 seconds to go up and another 0.9 to come down. So T total is 1.8 seconds. Now, I can say that X is equal to VX times T. VX I have up here is 16 meters per second times T, which is 1.8 seconds. And that'll give me my overall time, which is going to, or my overall range, which is 29 meters, or 30, yeah, 29 meters. I'm keeping two sig figs because I have two sig figs in this value. Okay, and then that's B. C, I already know that too, right, because I have this time. That's the total time for it to come back, to go up, and then come back down again. And now the final question. Today in class, we did a question similar to this is what is the speed of the ball at t equal 1.1 seconds? Now, I know that the ball is right here at 0.9 seconds, 
So I'm looking for the speed of the ball right about there, just after 0.9 seconds. I know that it has two components. It has an x component, which has a value of 16. It has an x component that has a value of 16 meters per second. That 16 meters per second is the initial velocity in the x direction. But because vx never changes, this is always the x component. It's always the velocity in the x direction will always be 16 meters per second because ax is equal to zero. However, there's another component to the velocity, which is going to be vy. And now I need to find that. I'll do it over here on the side. So vy is equal to v naught y plus ayt. That's going to be 9 meters per second minus 10 times 1.1 seconds. And that'll tell me what the velocity is. So it's going to be 9 minus 11 or negative 2 meters per second. It should be negative because I know that I've passed the peak of that trajectory. So that ball should be starting to come back down again. Or this, uh, yeah, this ball should start to come back down again. So at this point, I have a velocity of negative 2 meters per second. Now you might be inclined to say that it's 14 or 18, but when I have two vectors like that, to find the resultant, I have to do what we did in chapter 3 with the vectors. So to find the overall speed, I would say the square root of uh, 16 squared plus 2 squared, and that's going to be about 16. I don't know what the value 16 point something. Any one of those questions, or all of those questions, will be on your exam in a couple of weeks. So make sure you know those questions. That's why it's on the free response, because I want you to know these types of problems really well. I want you to be able to do them, like I said, without really thinking about them very much. How do you feel that you are on this, like on this, this question? It's something we've worked to in class a couple of times, any one of these. Could you do this question right now if I asked you to do it all by yourself with no help at all? Okay, no is probably the right answer to that answer, to that question, but by Monday, the answer should be yes, because you will see it. Okay? All right. Um, let's look at some conceptual questions, because we've done a lot of... Um, let's see. We've done a lot of these various things. All right, let's look at number five. That's the graphing stuff isn't going to go away. You're going to continue to see it. In fact, you saw it in lab this week with the, the basketball lab where you're videoing the motion, and you're going to see it probably on the exam. So uh, this is an object that's launched horizontally from a certain height and lands on the ground. And I want to know which of these is the Y position versus time. First of all, this looks like this. Okay, I have an object that I is shot like you did in lab where you shoot something horizontally off of a surface and it goes down. And you first want to ask yourself what happens to the velocity in the y direction? Uh, well, the y velocity is zero initially and then it gets bigger in the negative direction. So I'm looking for a graph here that has a slope that's zero and then increases with a negative slope. There are only two here that start with a zero slope. Which are those? A and B. So it has to be either A, or not A and D, uh, A and C. It has to be either A or C, because both of these have a zero slope at the beginning. And this has a zero Y velocity at the beginning of this motion. And then it increases, but in the negative direction. So this, this graph better have a negative slope. So which one is that going to be? The answer is going to be C. Right. So you can see questions like that, too. I love, love, love graphing questions. I love to see that you can take a physical situation and show me what it looks like in a graphical form. It really shows that you understand the physics and the math of, of representing that, that situation. OK? So be ready for those. It'll be something similar to this. Um, 
what would the x versus t graph look like for this situation? If I were to plot x versus t, what would it look like? Now think about the x velocity. What happens to the x velocity as this object travels through space? Does it increase, decrease, or stay the same? It stays the same. It stays the same because the x velocity is always constant because ax is equal to zero. So what would that tell you about the slope of this graph? Does this growth slope of the graph increase, decrease, or stay the same? It's going to stay the same. Now, you might be inclined to draw it like that. And now that is true that that graph has a constant slope, but this object doesn't stay in the same x position all the time. So it's not going to look like that. Instead, it's going to look like this. Y'all saw this in the lab that you did when you were throwing the basketball back and forth, that the x, the x graph should have a, a constant slope like this because the acceleration is zero. Okay, questions. I know I'm going kind of fast. I want to cover as much ground as possible. But if I'm leaving you behind, then this isn't really useful. So questions or pauses or I don't get it. Yeah. yeah, I have to clear this. I don't keep the ink. Yeah, I'm sorry. I can't keep it. You remember what you were going to ask? Uh, I sound like, 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 uh, okay, I'm really sorry. Yes. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, let's look at this one. I'll post your concept test this afternoon when I go back to my office. So I recommend that you go through and look at those. And, you know, look at the old test tree, but this comes from a concept test. If a plane drops a package, so the plane has this package in its cargo bay, and it wants to drop it down to, I don't know, wherever it's dropping it, uh, human aid or military or whatever, and it's dropping this package, I want to know where is the package when the plane is at, part, at position two. And so the question is, is this package just going to, fall straight down, in which case it would be in position B? Is it going to lag behind, in which case it would fall back to position A? Will it fall go with the plane, which means it would fall at C? Or will it actually, I mean, go at with the plane, so it's but it lags behind the plane, or go with the plane so that it falls at D? Now, if we're assuming no air resistance, or that it's negligible, where do you think it's going to go? Oh, that's a... And no, I would probably say the same. It would actually go to C if there was air resistance. So if there was air pushing on it, which, you know, there is, of course. But if we're assuming that there's no air resistance, it's not going to go to C. It's going to go to D. It's going to go to D. That whatever x velocity the plane has is going in this direction, the package is going to have the same x velocity. And as soon as you drop it, it starts dropping, but it can it continues to stay underneath the plane until it gets to the ground. Okay? It'll keep going like this until it falls onto the ground. There are a series of questions in the concept test to, to, to sort of explore that. You'll see it in some of the old quizzes too. Clear this, y'all? All right. Um, let's go back to another exam, unless there are specific questions from an exam. No spe any specific questions right now? No? I'm going to go back a little bit. Uh, let's see, you have seven, 16, 17, and 18, so let's go to fall 15. We see something we haven't done in class. A lot of these are things that we've done before, like number two here, uh, number three. Let's try number three. It is one that we've done in class, but it's one of the prototypical projectile motion problems. Let me sketch out to you what are the three different types of projectile motion problems. You'll see one like this, where it goes up and comes down. That's like a definite. You're definitely going to see that on the exam. 
you'll see one like this where it follows a path like that and then the other situation that we may see is where I have an object that goes at an angle but it's at a it's at some height so it's a combination of the first two where it goes like this you did all three of these actually you did the, the second and third in lab uh, if you have the third likely that's when I'll give you a time or I'll make it simpler in some way because the third problem it gets kind of tedious with the math so let's look right now we're looking at this one in question number three so a spring-loaded gun shoots a ball in the horizontal direction from a height of 20 meters and the ball travels hey Shayla, the ball travels three meters what is its initial velocity if you don't have the time in a projectile motion problem almost always the first thing you need to do is figure out the time actually in this one uh, well no we don't have the initial velocity so we can't find the X and Y components of the initial velocity but we can think about what the velocity is doing initially do we know what the initial X or Y component of the velocity is we do know the Y component of the velocity what is it it's not 20 it's zero right because this object is starting out in the horizontal it only has an x component so i know initially at least that v naught y is equal to zero i know that y is equal to negative 20. i've said why that's negative let me just recap this is y equals zero this is y equal negative 20 because i'm going down if you forget that negative you're going to encounter the square root of a negative number. If that happens, just backtrack. It's like, oh, yeah, right. This value has to be negative. So y is equal to negative 20. That's y at this point right here. And uh, x is equal to 3 meters. Now, I know that x is equal to vx times t. So if I can find t, I know x. I can find vx. It will be x over t. And since the y component is equal to 0, that will also be the initial velocity, which is really what I'm looking for. And I'm looking for the initial velocity, not the x component, but the actual initial, like the muzzle velocity of this spring-loaded gun. Just re recap that, reiterate. I own, my v naught is equal to vx only because it's in the horizontal direction only because v naught y is equal to zero so in order to find t i consider only the y the y motion y is equal to v naught y t plus one half a y t squared i know v naught y is zero so this whole term just goes away so y is negative 20 is equal to negative 5 t squared so t is equal to 2 seconds. Now that I have that, I can say x is 3 meters over 2 seconds. That's 1.5 meters per second. Yeah, uh, oh, Kate? Colin. Colin, I'm sorry, Colin. What you just said there, um, okay. I use Yeah, let's write down what you did. I, I'm not, I'm not sure what you did. So you said v y. Okay, and what did you put for v y? V y has zero. Okay, and what about v not y? All right. Yeah. All right. I'm going to scrap this then. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you. Be careful. Uh, as you get more familiar with these equations, you really just need to memorize these two equations. They're really just two. Not that hard to memorize. If you're really scrambling, if you haven't memorized, if they're not really part of your brain, then it's it's going to be difficult on the test. Like even if, even I you know write them on your scrap paper, but if you don't have them in your brain, then you're not really going to be able to work with them very well. Um, okay.
Can we go on to another question? Y'all could do this one if I gave it to you today? Right now? No? But you can by Monday, because you'll probably see it on Monday. I haven't made the quiz out yet, but, you know, it's one of our typical questions. Now, let's do a conceptual question. Oh, oh yeah, let's look at number four. So, all of these are true except one. Which one is not true? Let's just go through each one. The maximum height occurs at the midpoint of the flight. Uh, so the midpoint's right here. That's the maximum height, right? So that one's okay. The time of flight to half the maximum height is equal to a quarter of the total time of flight. Hmm. I don't know about that. Let's just skip over it. We'll come back to it. C, the path is a parabola. Is that true? It is a parabola, in fact. Uh, so that one's correct. Uh, the maximum range occurs when the launch angle is 45 degrees. Is that one true? Yeah, that one is true. You ever score your mind with your water hose, like a sibling or something? Right? Uh, if you go lower, the water doesn't go as far. But as you go up to 45 degrees, that's when you get the maximum range. It's true. When you square water, that's when you get your maximum range. That 45 degrees gives you an, a maximum amount of time in flight, and then it also gives it a maximum v naught x, so that you get a long enough time, but you still have an x component of the velocity that's big enough. Because if you, you know, if this is my 45 degree angle, if I shoot below here, it just doesn't go very high. If I shoot up here, it goes up high, so it's in the air for a long time, but then it doesn't have a very big x velocity. But if I shoot at 45 degrees, then it maximizes both of those. Um, let's look at part B. That one is right, but it's important to look at. So this is half the total time. And what this is saying is the time of flight to half the maximum height which would be right here, that this is a quarter of the maximum time. But I know that y is equal to one-half at squared. I left off of v-naught y, but that's not important right now. What I know is that y is proportional to t squared. And so y has a heavy dependence upon t, that as t increases, y increases all the more. That is not a linear relationship. That's really what I'm concerned about here. This assertion that I have half the time to get up to here, and then another half of that time to get up to here, that's what I'm saying, that I get to half the height and half the time to here. So I'm saying it to the half of a half of a quarter. That assertion assumes that there is a linear relationship between y and t, and there's not a linear relationship. You could probably model through this and get the right answer, even if you didn't think that. But that's really what we're getting at, that the relationship between y and t is quadratic, not linear. Okay? Take this away. I think students sometimes trip up on the conceptual questions. Make sure that's not you. I don't want you to trip up on them. Uh, they can become, I think often you spend a lot, a lot of time on the calculations because you think that's going to be the hardest. But sometimes it's the conceptual questions that really, you have to think a lot about them. So spend time on those too. You'll find that they're really a lot alike. Um, if you just spend time becoming familiar with them, then you'll, you'll sort of get the, the various nuances of them. Let's look at number five. I remember when I gave this question to students. Or befuddled by it. So a stone is thrown horizontally and follows the path x, y, z. I want to know the direction of the velocity vector at point y. So think about what happens to the, the velocity vectors. First, I have an x velocity vector that is always the same. And then I have a y velocity vector that's initially zero. It's initially zero. Was that me or was that somebody out there? Is that you? Uh, y and then it gets bigger in that direction. So I'm just asking what is the net vector 
at this point. If I add up those two vectors, I'm going to redraw it just a little bit. The net velocity at that point, doing our tail to tip method, looks like that. And so that's going to be, let's see, what does it have to be? It has to be B. Okay. Number eight. Another good conceptual question. I often ask a question that assesses, do you understand how the time is related to the Y displacement? The bigger the Y displacement, the bigger the time. It doesn't matter about the X displacement. The bigger the Y displacement, the bigger the time. And so here, if I'm asking which target will be hit first, even though target one is farther away, it's going to be hit before target two because it doesn't travel up as high. That Y is smaller, so it's going to hit target one first because that the trajectory for that what shell is lower than the trajectory for the first one. The hang time is dependent upon the Y displacement. Okay, folks? Yes? All right, let's, uh, I'm going to sort of skim through some of these. Uh, actually, it looks like this one stops at seven or eight. We'll look at another exam. Is that okay? All right, let's look at, that was 15. Let's look at 14. First, I'm going to just sort of skim through it. All this stuff is vector stuff. Uh, and number 14, number four, we might come back to that one. Uh, here's one like we were doing before. Oh, here's the Y component of the velocity. Oh, what, what's the answer for that one? Which of these represents the Y component of the velocity from an object that starts like this and travels like that? One thing I know about the Y motion is that the acceleration in the Y direction is always negative 10. So with that in mind, you should be able to pick out the answer to this right away. You should tell right away that the answer is D. Because if the acceleration in the Y direction is negative 10, then the slope of this graph has to equal negative 10. This one's positive, this one's positive, this one's zero. It has to be D because the slope is negative. Oh, actually, no. It's not D. You'll see why it's not D. Look at the sign of the velocity in this case. Can y'all see it okay? This is a good question. Huh? It's none of these. Right. Because the velocity here is initially negative, but the velocity over here in the y direction is initially positive. So really to make this correct, the graph would have to look like this. It would start up here and then go down like that. You should have seen a graph like that when you did your lab this week, the, uh, where you're throwing the basketballs back and forth, when you did the 2D motion in that lab. Okay, so the answer here is E. I don't know, some students tell me that if I have an all or none of these, that it's always that answer, but I don't feel like that's true. I think often it's not, but sometimes it is. So make sure you're, that you're looking at those options that you might think are not plausible. Okay, um, number 12, you'll see this in the concept test. Uh, a car is being pulled along on a horizontal track. Right, I'll take this. Cycle. So I'm, I'm the uh, train cart, I'm a railroad cart. Alright, if I have something and I'm going along at a constant velocity, and I throw it up, it comes straight back to me. It's sort of like the plane. This is like the plane, but flipped upside down. That as I throw it up, the paper still has the x velocity that I have. So it follows along with me. 
and then I can catch it. But what happens if I'm accelerating? If my velocity is increasing, my x velocity is increasing, when I throw this up, oh, this is, uh, no, this is correct. If I throw this up, it stops accelerating, but I continue accelerating. So what happens if I'm accelerating to the ball? Does it uh, fall into the car, behind the car? Huh? It's going to fall behind the car. Let's see if I can do this. It's hard to do. Okay? And then it falls behind you because you start accelerating. And that part or, or the, uh, the cannonball, it doesn't have the same x velocity anymore because, you know, you're not accelerating it anymore. Whew. Okay, uh, 13. Which has the longest hang time? A, B, or C? Come on, y'all know this. Quick, quick, quick. A, right. A has the longest hang time because it has the biggest Y displacement. Let's look at this question. A cannonball is fired horizontally 10 meters per second from a cliff. Its speed one second after being fired is about... I draw a picture. It has an initial velocity of 10 meters per second. That's Vx. And then I want to know what is its velocity at 10 meters at one second. At one second, it's right here. It still has the 10 meters per second, but with an acceleration of minus 10 meters per second squared, after one second, it has what y velocity? It's accelerating at 10 meters per second per second. So after one second, it has a velocity of no, not 20. 10, right? Because I know v at 10 meters per second per second for every second. It has an increase in velocity of 10 meters per second. That's what acceleration means, right? 10 meters per second per second. So V is equal to V naught plus AT. We're looking at the Y component of this. So it's going to be 0 minus 10 times 1 second. It's going to be negative 10. So I have a Y component of that velocity of 10 meters per second. And then an X component of 10 meters per second. And so the total speed is going to be 10 squared plus 10 squared. Is that 16? I think it's 16. No, 14. Sorry, 14. Okay. I clear this, y'all? Is this helpful for you? I'm a little worried about the quiz on Monday because the clicker questions in class haven't been going real great. I know that projectile motion, it's kind of complicated and, you know, it's, it's difficult. And fortunately, you have some time before the exam to really mesh it into your head. But I want you all to do really well in the quiz, too. All right, I'm going to clear this. Let's go to another exam. We'll go back to fall 13. Uh, this was back when I called them quizzes. Huh, yeah, let's do this one. So this one's a little bit different. It's similar to ones that we were doing, but here I'm looking for the distance, the distance that this plane will drop a package in order to hit the target x. You're, you know, you're plotting out the trajectory of this bomb or whatever the package is. Um, so if I have this package and I know that I release it, it's going to follow a path like that. Um, in order to find d, or I'm going to call it x, in order to find x, I know that x is equal to vx times t. So x is going to equal to 42 meters per second times whatever my time is. So I don't know what the time is, but how do I find the time for this trajectory? How long will it take to go from the plane down to point x? What do I consider? What, is it the y or the x displacement that determines the time that it's in the air? It's the y displacement. And so I'm going to say y 
is equal to v naught y t plus one half a y t squared. This is just like the problem. We're just I'm dropping something, and I want to know how long does it take to reach the bottom. So a half a kilometer, that's 500 meters. V naught y is zero. So this whole term goes away. Is equal to minus 5 t squared. T is equal to 10 seconds. Uh, this will be minus 500 because I'm going from zero down 500 meters or a half a kilometer. So that's t equal 10 seconds. Um, so this over here will be 42 times 10 or 420 meters. All right? That's D. We'll wrap up in just a couple minutes, but any questions or concerns about Monday or Wednesday's quiz are just the light. Any other questions? Yeah. Any test, yeah. I, I wouldn't go back as far as say, well, let's see. My test used to be a lot harder. In general, actually, no, I think you could go back as far. I, I, my first three years that I was here, my tests were really unreasonable. But I'm a more reasonable person now. It's pretty typical. Yeah, go back as far as far as it'll go, all the way back to 08. Okay. Questions? Other questions? All right. Make sure you drop by. Just make sure that I got you uh, before you leave.